episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Karema Mutlu, and today I have with me the founder and chief chairman of McEwen Mining, Rob McEwen. Welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you very much. Today I just want to talk about your early career when you built Gold Corp. Can you go through the process of what it was like back then to build a company and a gold company back in the 80s and 90s? Building a company. Well, I, I started out with a plan and I had purchased a, I had a closed end fund and I wanted to move it into becoming a mining company because closed, the closed end fund was trading at a 50% discount to its net asset value. And at the time, gold stocks were trading at two to three times net asset value. And I thought if I could combine the two, um, I could lift it and get a, um, a 400 to 600% return on my money. So I ended up buying control of two companies that were in a part of a hostile takeover bid. And I did a broadside on the hostile and ended up in control of uh, two mining companies. And then it ended up in a string of five companies that over a period of eight years and three share restructurings um, created Gold Corp. So when we got Gold Corp going, it had some debt and I worked to uh, augment the cash flow, get rid of the debt, and then we started exploring in Red Lake. And I gave them $10 million. Um, they went exploring, and four months later, they came back and said, look, we've got something you might like. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, we, the average grade of the nine drill holes we're gonna tell you about is running 30 times what we're mining right now. Wow. So, what was it like? Um, a lot of inertia. Uh, having come from the investment industry into the mining industry, it was like stepping into a vat of quick drying cement that uh, you just didn't have a lot of flexibility. And you had to change the attitude of everybody working in, at the company. They were just, they weren't open to new ideas, or at least they'd been trained not to believe they should use new ideas and getting them to break that mold. Um, we then, and part of that was um, I wanted to introduce new technologies, um, training, and there was a union year there, the United Steelworkers, and they didn't agree. So uh, they went out on strike and it took, uh, they were out on strike. Uh, there, we didn't produce anything, any gold for 46 months. Um, and during that time, we tore down the old uh, mill buildings, process plant, reconstructed it, re, um, reworked and renovated the shaft, lined the whole mine with fiber optics, put webcams uh, throughout the mine and the surface, and took it from what I thought I viewed as the 19th century into the 21st century. Uh, I got a death threat during that period. Uh, my home, all the windows in the basement and first floor were placed, replaced with bulletproof glass. Um, two SWAT teams, full body armor, automatic weapons showed at my house twice. That was sort of interesting. <laughs> uh, and it was, and having come from the investment industry, the, in, the financial markets looked at it and said, well, what's a money manager know about mining? So. There was a lot of doubt as to what would happen, skepticism. But over time, some of my largest critics at the beginning became my biggest shareholders five years out. So when you ask what it was like, it was a slow process of building. It meant pushing old ideas away and trying to inject new technologies and saying we're in business to make money. We're not in business just to blow up rock and move it around and crush it. And a lot of people really love just doing that, but you have to do it at a profit for it to make sense. So when we came back into production after the strike was over, we went from producing 50,000 ounces of gold a year at the mine to 500,000 ounces of gold a year. And our cost of producing an ounce of gold went from $360 an ounce to $60 an ounce. So there was a 60-fold change in the economics. And I'd have to say 
it was a bit like a rocket ride. Um, the, the last 13 years running the company, the share price grew at a compound annual growth rate of better than 31%. So we were up more than 3,000%. In 2016, we had a great run in the gold equities. So where are we now? We're about halfway through a bull market in gold that started in the beginning of 2016. And a lot of the, mar the broad market wouldn't recognize that. Uh, gold's only up about 22% right now from that period. And the S&P's up almost 40. And the Dow's up a little bit more than that. But if you looked at the GDX, um, it's up 53%, but most people aren't looking at that. The most explosive move in a, in a bull market occurs in the latter half of the bull market. And frequently, the, the last year or so of the bull market is where the curve turns exponential and just you have incredible returns. But we're already up about 170% from where we started. We're ahead of where the, the public sees us. And what we need now is to see more, probably more mergers, acquisitions, and more press. There's very little press, media coverage of the gold segment. If you were to look at Newmont as a proxy for uh, how much the public owns gold. And I say use it as a proxy because it's only, it is the only gold company in the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 represents 80% of the public capitalization in America. And Newmont's market cap as a percentage of the aggregate market cap of the S&P is 0.1%. So 99.9% .9 of the market is not in gold and not paying any attention to it. But the metals and gold tend to be, in the past cycles, performers in the last segment of a bull equity market. So we're making progress. The, all the reasons why you should be thinking about using gold uh, in your portfolio as a diversifier, as a form of insurance, are there high debt levels, rapid monetary expansion is still going on. If you look around the world, 72 currencies at least are going, the price of gold is going up in those currencies. And it will be a question of confidence in the dollar. And when that starts to wane, you're going to see gold start moving quite strongly in all currencies. Very good. Yesterday you gave a keynote speech about what you're doing today. So can you go over a brief overview of what you've done and in terms of for the queue and mining, where are you today? I covered a lot of topics yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I gave a, a case for gold and why it's, uh, I see it strengthening in the marketplace. Um, you can look at where are we in the broad market and there's a huge premium being paid for growth right now, and particularly growth without profits in um, the technology sector, the bio sector. And that, at some point, w this bull market that we've been in, this amazing bull market that's been going on for well over eight years now, is nearing its top. So. The downside risk is large in the broad market. The gold market, having gone through a bear market that was one of the longest and the deepest experienced in the last 77 years, is just coming off its bottom with a 2x, 3x potential if it were to get to the average type of return. So I'm saying it's time to rotate some of your money out of the broad market into gold. Um, with respect to McEwen Mining, we have four sources of operation. We'll, have our, we'll be declaring commercial production in Nevada on our newest mine uh, this quarter, before the end of the quarter. Uh, we have gold and silver production coming out of Canada, Mexico, Argentina, and soon Nevada. We'll do 200,000 ounces of gold this year. 
We have a very large exploration program of $27 million. The bulk of that is being spent in Canada and the United States. Um, the Black Fox mine, which we bought for $35 million, and the previous owner had put in $560 million. Um, we're doing quite a bit of exploration there and, and getting very encouraging results. And we think there's room over the next couple of years, at least the concept right now is to more than double production from our operations um, by bringing in production from satellite deposits around the existing mine. We've experienced uh, some good grade intercepts and with a good exploration program, we're going to be running for quite some time with um, exploration news coming out during the year. We've gone, and I explained that our first quarter was particularly ugly. <laughs> we had some events that I <laughs> certainly didn't anticipate, and I'd say I'm prepared to give out the Darwin Awards to some of the people that had caused these events. Um, but those are all behind us now, and uh, we're well financed. It'll carry us through easily through next year, and by that point our cash flow should be fine. We might need some money if we were to go buy something, but at the moment we're just building our own assets. And we have organic growth that over the next three or four years could give us a 50% increase over the 200,000 ounces that we're uh, currently producing. Um, uh, I went over the fact that my personal investment in the company is um, better than $160 million. Uh, I own 22% of the company. I put, it, I put in $28 million additional in the, since last uh, August, more recently in uh, March. And uh, I take a dollar a year in salary. Don't have any options, don't have any bonus. And I just wanted to be right beside my fellow share owners in terms of feeling the pain and the joy if the stock goes down or up. Um, and I concluded with what I call a mining rant. And I think the, everybody associated with the public markets, not just the mining area, should be pushing back against the regulators and the, the accounting conventions and saying, look, we want to get clear information on anything that's sent to us, like a prospectus, like an annual report. Having financial statements that have 25 to 50 pages of notes aren't much use to anybody. Having prospectuses that are 200, 300, 400 pages long, when they come through the, in the mail, the first place they go is the garbage. Um, Make it simple, make it clear, make it easily understood. And I said, we really need a day when Moses comes down from the mount again and just says, here are the 10 rules of the financial world. And everybody knows them. Right now, the securities acts are like this, and there's no one in the world that knows all the rules or understands them. So we can't, as a group, have a common knowledge if someone's offside. And we should be able to blow a whistle and say, you're off the field, you're out of the game because you violated those rules. And, and it's this lack of ability to call someone out and a common knowledge, I think, is destroying the trust in the capital markets. And if it continues, it will destroy the way we live. Um, the other thing, I started off by just talking about what my wife and I have been doing. We've uh, over the last uh, 12 years, donated $70 million to uh, medical research. In the, uh, we have a center that does work in regenerative medicine and stem cell research since 2003. And we felt the healthcare system was under a lot of stress, that it wasn't going to be able to scale up fast enough to, the re to deal with the retiring baby boom and there's going to be a rationalization of services in that field and an increasing expense. And regenerative medicine and stem cell research held out the promise of profoundly changing in a positive way the delivery of healthcare. 
not only uh, in the country but to the world. Uh, so we thought that was a very good place to put some money. Uh, we put it into education, into leadership, um, and entrepreneurship as well. Um, and I'd like to just, the profits coming from McEwen Mining are just going to keep me going into medical research and educational pursuits. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time today, Rob. It's a pleasure thank to see you at the island. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?